Battlefield is a Call of Duty competitor known for its larger maps of vehicle combat, among other things. So what would it look like if it departed from mechanized warfare to try their hand at cop drama? Battlefield Hardline. Hi! Christ! The epilogue starts with our protagonist Mendoza, a Cuban immigrant cop, three years before his prison transfer. Ooh, foreshadowing. This is Stoggard. The corner. Cuban. Jesus Christ, Nick, you're in vice now. Why do you have worked better than beans and rice? Not a great guy. You knock on the door, kick it in, and start making arrests. There's no way to fail this part. Everybody is very patient. Things do get exciting, though. Be out by the morning, cop. You fucking know it. Yeah? The pilot coaxes otherwise. Fuck you! Oh, shit, you're not a cop! Get down now, cover! A neat little detail. If you don't kick the door in right away after knocking, you can actually hear them talking to the bathroom bimbo. It does make it strange that they're still surprised by her after this dialogue, though, and the drugs are still on the table. Police! We're coming in! Also, that guy we cuffed got out of them somehow. Poor guy. A dude that didn't hear the gunshots walks in with lunch, runs, and a super rad chase scene kicks off. Driving in this game is weird, like a brick on ice, if that makes any sense. You also reach your top speed very quickly, but it feels like you're going 40 miles per hour and get slower the closer you get to the target so you don't accidentally catch up with him. It's not very satisfying. The most difficult part of the chase is accidentally taking a wrong turn, but once you realize the map on the bottom left only allows you to move in one direction, it simplifies things immensely. The end result is a slow, simple gameplay sequence with dialogue and visuals portraying something much more exciting. The epilogue ends with an 80s cop drama montage we move into episode 1. Starts with a cutscene just a few hours after the epilogue. Protagonist is getting a new partner, Kai and going after the source of the drugs they found. Mendoza shot three people and caught around with his vest, but they're keeping him at work. No hospital, no investigation, no time off. What a shitty department. Mendoza's last run in the field, no offense, was a total clusterfuck. After the unskippable cutscene is an unskippable driving scene, followed by an unskippable walking scene that can be summarized by... From Cuba, city bad. We cuff and interrogate a guy to get to our next objective. Then just leave him there. Great police work. Fun tidbit, it is actually possible to fail this section and he pulls a gun on you if you do. Which highlights the fact that Mendoza never patted him down for weapons when cuffing him. Kinda sloppy. Next up is a tutorial section for the main gameplay loop. This battlefield is primarily a stealth game. No, I'm not joking. The game is a series of point A to point B objectives with enemies in the way. Sometimes it will force a fight, but typically you're given a choice to go in quiet or loud. But side goals like warrant arrests require stealth, and the only way to gain experience from enemies are from non-lethal takedowns. By the way, I'm not a cop, and I barely understand what laws are, so I asked a guy and he recommended against surprise brain trauma. You'll occasionally see comments like this on screen when relevant. We catch the source of the drugs found in the epilogue. Wire him up and use him to catch his boss. A new piece of gear is introduced. A magical handheld device that can identify goons and pull their records by using the backs of their heads, run chemical tests from a distance, and give directions. With this level of magic, Cthulhu is now canon in the Battlefield universe. Snitch work gets interrupted by some hooligans and another stealth rest tutorial plays. Enemies have an aggro meter that goes up with time. If it fills, they draw on you, but it can be reset by aiming at them. If you're with a friend, they can keep one person's aggro down at a time. In this tutorial, your buddy is incompetent and lets them draw as you're making an arrest. 
This is the only time this actually happens, though. Throughout the rest of the game, aggro meters are paused as you make arrests, even when alone, which is really helpful for gameplay, but it also means that the criminals are just super, super polite. Turns out the boss, Tyson, was on Shatterbait and not in person. So Kai throws in her pocket hacker, very nifty, and you calmly leave to go pick him up. We show up at Tyson's house, slam our loaded gun against the door, and have a little chat. We try taking him into protective custody, but get rudely interrupted. The gameplay shifts here, as we need to keep pressure on the wound with one hand as we shoot with the other, which really comes down to holding the left joystick forward as you use the right joystick and bumper to aim and fire, with absolutely no benefit to releasing the left joystick. You still shoot one-handed. Still, if you choose not to help her for nearly the entire fight, for whatever reason, she will keel over. Which is neat, I guess. A van drives through the wall, SWAT arrives, Kai survives, and Tyson gets taken into custody. End of episode 1. It's needlessly slow. There's some fun stuff in there, but, you know, it's a tutorial, so I won't judge it too harshly for dragging its feet. Episode 2. Kai is back. Against her doctor's advice, but not mine. God, what a shit department. Tyson lawyered his way out, but lucky us, a cartel supplier is turning snitch, so we gotta go pick him up. The chief implies some cops may be crooked. Spooky. Leo knows Kai, but not Mendoza, and things get tense. But some hooligans show up, behind us, and shoot one of Leo's guys, but not the two cops standing closer to them. The rest of this mission is chasing Leo through the building, and it's honestly a pretty good time. A quick note regarding civilians. This is a cop game. You're a cop, so you can't go around shooting innocent people. The game achieves this by locking your trigger whenever you're aiming at one, which results in some unjustified behavior with zero consequences. It would be better if an unjust shoot resulted in an immediate game over screen, would force you to consider your shots and could lead to interesting encounters with crowds of civilians running between shooters. While we're here, the primary collectibles are evidence that you can scan with the magic box. They're spread across the episodes and tied to different investigations. Complete an investigation and you unlock some new guns. Guns in this game are fine. It's a copy-paste from other Battlefield games. But with the stealth gameplay incentivized, you don't really get a chance to have fun with them unless you accept missing out on some higher tier weapons unlocked through experience gained from stealth arrests. Also, the loadout is one primary, one sidearm, and there's a very common bug that prevents the primary from firing. Very annoying. Oh, right. The investigations. You unlock a gun, but also a short cinematic. These reveal behind-the-scenes stuff in the criminal organizations and are a really neat bit of world-building. So we finally catch up to Leo and our partner. Ow. Hey, you alright? It's being very unprofessional. We, or you, since Kai has to carry someone now, fight off a wave of enemies and steal a truck. This part is stupid. The only way to fail is to park and wait. The cleverly disguised killdozer takes you to the end of the episode, no problem. A new detective? Huh? Are you sure that Leo was injured on the ride here? If and when you're asked, that's what you'll say? Yes, sir. I will. Good. I'll get Leo someplace more discreet. You're both dismissed! What the hell just happened? Ass cover and get used to it. Kai and the Chief are obviously bad dudes. No idea how the Chief keeps dozens of bodies in-house, by the way, but this is the moment Mendoza should go above his head. Talk to Internal Affairs. You can't trust these people. End of Episode 2. The Swamp. So much of this episode is cruising around on an airboat. It is mind-numbing. It's two large maps with objectives at the edges and the occasional Nito in the middle. Leo's intel sent us here. Smugglers are airdropping goodies, so we're here to GPS tag them. Hello, Leo. At the end of the first map, we get QTE'd by a gator. 
The directions match the position of Mendoza's arms, which is really neat. But if you use that to hold the right position before the prompt tells you, it won't trigger and the gator will chomp you. That took a lot of deaths for me to figure it out. We get two new pieces of equipment here, a grapple hook and zip line. Equipment fills an additional two slots of inventory and with the exception of flak armor is extremely situational. Outside of the swamp, the only time the grapple hook is useful is in the finale and there's gear bag right where it's needed. The zip line is never again useful and it loves to glitch. The gas mask gives minor passive benefits and gives me a giggle when it goofs cutscenes. So, gas mask all the way. Remember that we're a cop. You want to call this in? We're not exactly in our jurisdiction here. Let's find Meltz first. He's more ambitious than I thought. So we're just leaving a bunch of people handcuffed, in the swamp, with hungry hungry gators. But wait, it gets worse. So if we're off the books, deeply off the books, I'm fine with it. Saves lives. Hey, I'm not arguing. So we are A-OK -okay with off the books. Tailing? Sure. Finding leads? Why not? But we are out here killing people off the books. Straight up multiple homicide with a police chief covering for you. God damn. After clearing two camps, we know where the boss, Neltz, is meeting and drive to the stadium. Before we get to Neltz, I just want to show you a clip real quick that perfectly demonstrates how ridiculous this stealth arrest system is. Freeze! Hey, I'm what? putting you under arrest. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yo, you got it! Motherfucker! I got you covered from here, partner. Get back! We find Neltz, who says to chill he made a deal with Stoddard and takes off. He's cornered in a warehouse with Stoddard controlling the SWAT team. We sneak in and kill everyone. It is insane what we can do without repercussions. So after killing the whole building, we meet Neltz on the top floor. He says he made a deal with Stoddard. Stoddard walks in and shoots him. Mendoza cries about it. Stoddard gives Mendoza and Kai some cash. Mendoza drops the cash and leaves. Up until scripting for this video, after many playthroughs, I thought this was the perfect time to go to internal affairs. Stoddard is taking bribes and murdered someone right in front of him. But during scripting, the whole killing people off the books thing hit me. Mendoza crawled through a corpse pile to get offended at Stoddard. I don't even know why he's mad. He has no leg to stand on. End of episode 3. Chief and Kai reveal that Kai taking the money was just a test, I promise, guys. And they send you back to the warehouse to find evidence against Stoddard. It's kind of neat going back through the same building you fought through, but now as a crime scene instead. And the approaching hurricane offers a good excuse for why there's no cops watching the scene. Once in the penthouse, the power of the magic box is fully revealed. Scanning the portrait shows fingerprints. Scanning the keypad immediately gives you the password. Crime scene investigators already went through the building. Why don't they have a magic box? Why don't you just point the magic box at Stoddard? Or Congress? This was possibly the laziest way to do this. I imagine if the code was hidden in a locked drawer or something that you had to find, it would be a much more satisfying result, and wouldn't just bring eldritch guru magic into the whole story. Now we have the evidence against Stoddard. Kai drops us off at a warehouse full of goons and leaves us to do it all alone so she can creep on a suspicious van. What a shit partner. We get in with the old Baltimore key and follow Stoddard into the basement, who's some sort of boss here. We are following him, so of course, we keep it quiet. Stop it! There's a pot farm in the basement, and since we're a good cop, we stealth arrest everyone. No need for anyone to get hurt. Anyone else to get hurt. We confront Stoddard, he saves our life, and there's an explosion. In the 30 seconds we've been talking to Stoddard, the hooligans set their own place on fire. So we shoot our way out. 
Kai got herself into a whoopsie, so now we have to go save her. Didn't pull anyone out of the flaming building, didn't even report it. So all those farmers we handcuffed are slow roasting and Mendoza doesn't even consider it worth mentioning. Great cop. Might actually be a serial killer. We make our way through the mall with our buddy Stoddard and rescue Kai. The whole time Mendoza is telling Stoddard how he's going to take him to internal affairs. So any excuse I gave for why he didn't report him earlier is null and void if he's going to do it now. Better hope Stoddard doesn't mention all the off-the-books work you've been doing. Mendoza gives Chief the evidence, and the Chief smashes it. Dum dum dum! I guess now they have to worry about Mendoza telling Eternal Affairs about all their off-the-books killings. Or not. It never comes up. End of episode 4. Hey, we're back in Orange, and it's our old buddy Snitch. Happy day. And Tyson too? I wonder what he's doing here. This episode stands out. Prison cops swarm the town armed with tasers, which means the only weapon we can get is a taser. No gear, no guns, no force fights, this is a fully dedicated stealth episode. It's... okay? Removing guns removes the backup option of shooting your way out, so it does up the ante by giving bigger consequences to getting caught. Is that worth removing a gameplay option, though? I don't know. Also, you get to blow up a meth lab. Tyson meets you at the watchtower. He doesn't explain anything, but he's helping. Now we gotta stealth down the half-life side of the hill. Much less cover and helicopter spotlights up the difficulty, but we can still cheese it. Turns out, the driver was Kai. Chief was good at screwing people over, so eventually she got got too. Now we're all out for revenge. Okay-ish escape, all things considered, since Kai's a cop still, I, I think. She can still get through the roadblocks. What I don't understand is why they didn't just pull Mendoza from the wreckage and throw him into the car. That would be a better plan, so to get our stealth episode, they should have had that plan go wrong somehow. Whatever. End of episode 5. Chief retired and started up a private security company, with the end goal of replacing the police. Bold play, Cotton. Kai's got an IT informant that she thinks can expose him, but he's a little busy with the Korean mob, so we gotta collect. We enter a dealership through the front door. No alarm. Nice. Or, if you're a man, the window. Whoa! What the hell are you doing? Hey, you see a faster way? Let's find that computer. Once inside, we find a computer and plug in the magic hacking stick. While we wait on the download, the silent alarm we tripped sends waves of enemies at us. Now is a good time to talk difficulty. On the easiest, you can walk and gun through just about the whole game. On the hardest, you may want to take cover occasionally. The difficulty setting affects the damage enemies do to you, and that is about it. Stealth is unaffected. So again, it heavily incentivizes stealth. At high difficulty, there are exactly two times that are difficult, or borderline unfair, really. This is one of them. The game plays as a light challenge stealth game, and a no challenge shooter, then spikes when up against a mounted gun that shoots through walls. The Korean mob are very upset that I broke their window. Understandable, but I'm not sorry. We drive off to find the IT guy, Boomer. Don't worry, we left a window rolled down. We go get his laptop and accidentally commit minor terrorism. You know, when in Rome. So we get back to the car with Boomer and Tyson for another driving segment. That trick I learned of just using the map to steer really came in handy here. Then there's a shift. You're in the passenger seat, hanging out of the car with infinite ammo. Mindless, stupid fun. But hey, it is fun. Now we have fully escaped the mob with everything we came for. But hey, we're felons now. Why not kill a mob boss? So we can stealth the rest all the way up until the room the boss is in, because the boss needs to be dead for the plot. So stealth arrests are still a thing, including open warrants. I understand if Mendoza cuffs people to keep the body count low, 
but these people he cuffs will get released by their buddies when they show up. We're still using police mechanics as a wanted felon. I guess the gameplay team and the story team weren't talking to each other. Oh well. We kill the boss and Tyson tries to steal a pallet of coke for resale. A pallet. So our upstanding police officer is working with a drug lord, not a prior drug dealer. Also, little thing, drug exposure like this would definitely get you high. Possibly overdose. This is coming from some Coast Guard buddies I used to have. Those dudes are insane. Anyway, missed opportunity to show some symptoms here. That could be fun. Boomer uses the stolen data to find a big multi-mob party, and we go to spy on it. Remember why we got Boomer in the first place? Kai told us he had intel that can bring down Chief. I guess she forgot too. So, we kill the power and break into the house. Fun fact, if you're a shitter like me and decide to just start breaking things, you'll fail the mission. Makes sense, since it wouldn't be sneaky to break all the windows. It just makes me question why they didn't use this principle in other ways, like shooting civilians. The party starts early and we share a closet with Kai as we creep on the meeting. Stoddard gives a sales pitch to some West Coast drug lords. The same network built up by Chief in Miami can be done here. Okay, but Chief was in the force for decades. How is Stoddard going to repeat the process in California at the drop of a hat? I feel like the game skipped some steps in its world building here. We sneak across the property to get to a briefcase of money to plant a bug in it, but we get caught. Well, you look Mexican, so I'll assume you're a burglar, but- They shoot out the floor and the second difficulty spike hits. Earlier I said there were two difficulty spikes. That was a lie. There are actually three. I just forgot about this one. No, I'm not re-recording. Windows 8 barely lets me scrape these clips together as is. Also, this was barely a lie. The fight isn't unfair like the other two, but any cover still leaves you vulnerable on one side, and the slow health regen means any damage you take is probably still there when the next shooter gets an angle on you. End of episode 7. Boomer tracked the bug to the chief's stronghold. So from the mob's perspective, we tried to rob him, killed everyone, and then just left the money behind. And they weren't the least bit suspicious of this. Spoilers, they are. Anyway, we need a safe cracking tool to get into chief's safe. Don't know why we're robbing him, but as soon as we learn he has a safe, everybody's on board with a heist. Boomer's got some old friends with a safe cracking bot, so off we go. Just like the swamp, there is a lot of just driving around. Boomer's bitch yaps a lot, but even with her dialogue, there's long stretches of silence as we slowly drive down roads. We meet Boomer's boys, and the militia immediately takes us hostage. Mendoza, because Stoddard put a bounty on him, and Boomer, because he just doesn't like him. But he swears he's not racist. Boomer's girl snuck him a key, and we make our way out of the silo. All our weapons or gear are gone, but unlike the escape mission with the tasers, these guys actually carry guns. It's a fairly short segment, but it's fun. While wandering, we overhear some goons talking about how their boss kicked out all the non-whites. I don't know why the boss cared if Boomer thought he was racist, but... Yeah, these guys are stereotypes. When on the road with Boomer's bitch, we get a fake out because she's just so crazy, lol, and we get ambushed. The bitch got her arm shot leg broken, but she can still walk around somehow. We get shot at and take cover in a gas station. This is the last difficulty spike. I promise I'm super sure this time. Waves of enemies come at you in vans and doom buggy thingies. The vans aren't a big deal, but the buggies have mounted guns on them that can tear through all the walls and cover. We're trapped in a small box with paper walls as people shoot machine guns through it. Easy to hard. Difficulty whiplash. Boomer's bitch wanders off on her broken leg and we continue to the airstrip to steal the safe cracker. We reach the airfield. Boomer, the IT guy, starts repairing a plane for our escape. Mendoza knows how to fly somehow. Don't worry about it. Now I teased this earlier. Remember, you are a cop. 
The militia shows up, so you jump into a busted plane and use its fully operational and fully loaded cannon to blow them all up. It's stupid, but I had a blast. We collect the safe cracker and some hooligans shell us. Guess what we find? Fueled, loaded, unlocked, and in the parking lot. Remember our cop buddy, Detective Sarsaparilla? I asked him how long police tank training takes as a joke, and now I regret to inform all of you that police do not actually receive tank training. End of episode 8. As we're prepping for the heist, Stoddard finds us and we put him down. Chief calls and we send a text of his corpse. So here's the heist plan. Get to the chief's private elevator. Use explosives on the rooftop water tank to flood the elevator shaft. Swim up to the penthouse suite. Open the door for Tyson. And use the safe cracking bot on the safe. It all goes well. We have a fun fight as we wait on the safe cracker. Plenty of cover, allies, and ammo. Once the safe is open, Tyson stares at a bomb for three full seconds without moving. Rip Bozo. Chief calls on the same phone we used to bug the money. I don't know how they didn't see this coming. The phone wasn't really hidden, and I still don't know what the point of the heist was. Right, back on track, Chief invites us to his island, and we're all rappelled down the tower. I'm just going to let this whole clip play. Imagine the cop that gets burritos at your local gas station doing this. After we fight to the boat, episode 9 ends. The boat pulls up to the island. Tyson needs a doctor badly. Kai tries to join Mendoza, but he insists she goes with Tyson to one of her off-the-books doctors. He refuses to go with them and will face Chief on his own. A cop that just wanted to do the right thing, motivated to be better than his father broken down by the chief's influence and betrayal until he became the very thing that he hates. No prospects, no moral duty, all he has left is revenge. It's a decent moment, dampened significantly by his nonchalant use of violence even in episode 1, and how quickly he was okay with off-the-books killing. The final episode is one Big map with groups of baddies we could totally ignore if we wanted to, and a final house. Scale the cliffs with a grapple hook to use stealth, or jump the wall with a motorcycle and let loose some hot lead. Either way, it's pretty fun. We confront the chief. He offers to let us into his organization, and we politely decline. On his desk is a letter addressed to us. He explains his empire is all about risk reduction. Drug lords pay him to keep the cops away. He pays the cops a fraction and they know who to let slide. The criminals are directly paying for risk reduction and the cops are more than happy to avoid getting shot at with a small cash bonus. Chief explains that there are too many lives and reputations at risk for his operations to be exposed now and it's up to Mendoza to keep things running. Honestly, my first few playthroughs, I thought this was fucking stupid because I had conflated his operations with his private police goals. Mendoza is a known felon, so could never operate openly. So he'll never privatize the police like the chief wanted. But he can still keep the illegal business running if he wanted to. The drug lords and police want operations to continue, 
and he can kill or blackmail anyone that causes problems. Summarize. The game is a cop drama where no cop procedures are followed. The stealth system is nonsensical. The fight difficulty is very easy until it spikes. The characters have skills that don't make sense for them to have. The rewards are achieved through non-lethals, but award you with lethals. A lot of the game is painfully slow, and the protagonist is a bloodthirsty monster. If you can get this game for 5 to 10 bucks, it might be worth it. But it's too silly to take seriously and too slow to enjoy as a silly shooter, especially on replays with all those unskippable cutscenes and long driving or walking segments. Remember to drink water. Have a good one. Okay, the video's over, but when looking at fan art for thumbnail inspiration, I came across this article, Battlefield Hardline is Reagan-era drug war propaganda. And it is way too funny not to share. To be nice, it did get the whole non-lethal to unlock cooler guns level up shenanigans. But it also says arresting people in an arcade game is less satisfying than shooting them and there's not enough racism. I know he's babbling about politics, but the bad faith interpretation that the game is bad because we don't shoot enough black people is way too fucking funny.